Hello, welcome. My name is Carolina Londoño Michel, and I am a geoscience faculty at Chandler Gilbert Community College. CGCC sits on the traditional lands of the Akimen Otam, the river people, and the Pipash. This group now live east of our campuses in what is known as the Gila River Indian community. And today I'm coming to you from beautiful Tempe, Arizona, the ancestral homelands on the waterways of the Akima, the Hono Otam, and Pipash people, and their ancestor, the Hokokam. Hokokam, sorry. There were certainly other tribal communities that utilized this. Of the yeah. Let me know what happens again. So one of the series, uh, one of the goals of the series is to highlight the connections of the sciences and the contributions of these fields, as well as to highlight career opportunities for underrepresented populations. Thank you to Mike Curtis and the IT team the multicultural and co-curricular events at CGC, and also to our speaker. And before I introduce her, I wanna remind you of our housekeeping rules. Please use the chat to comment and contribute to the discussion, to ask questions. Remember to be engaged, be kind, and students use the link to register so we know that you attended and you get credit. So it is my honor to introduce you to Dr. Diane Thompson. She's assistant professor in the geosciences department at the University of Arizona and the director of marine research at the Biosphere 2. Diane, like most earth scientists, is a multidisciplinarian. Her research draws on the fields of ecology, paleoecology, and paleoclimatology. That means that she investigates climates and coral reefs of the past. She then tests novel solutions, exciting experiments for reef restoration at the Biosphere 2. And the ultimate goal is to preserve reefs under current and future climate change. Her work spans a range of scales from local to global and capitalizes on, on a blend of field and laboratory observational and modeling and experimental and theoretical approaches. She's also a great speaker and we're very thankful to have her here today. Please help me welcoming Diane Thompson. Dr. Thompson, thank you uh, for your impactful research and for taking the time to share it with our students and larger community today. So please take it away. Thank you so much, Carolina. It's so great to be with you all today. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, okay, um, Carolina, can you see my screen? Is that looking good? Yes, that looks great. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and continue then. So it's been, uh, again, my pleasure to be here today um, and speak to you today. Um, so today we're going to take a journey to the depths of the seafloor together and back again here to Tucson at the Biosphere 2 at the University of Arizona to explore tropical climate change. So how our tropical oceans are changing with our changing climate and how this is impacting uh, coral reef ecosystems. So to begin, I'd like to start with a quote from an inspiring female ocean scientist, Sylvia Earle, who has explored the ocean depths by submarine. She says, even if you've never had the chance to see or touch the ocean, the ocean touches you with every breath you take, every drop of water you drink, and every bite you consume. So everyone everywhere is inextricably connected to and utterly dependent on the existence of the sea. So today we're gonna together explore how our oceans have played a role in shaping Earth's climate, how our oceans are changing now and through Earth's history, and how uh, we're doing work at the Biosphere 2 at the University of Arizona to really try to harness this knowledge 
to build solutions for a resilient future. So to begin, let's explore how the oceans shape Earth's climate and water availability, even here in Arizona in the Sonoran Desert. So the uniqueness of our water planet is evident even from space. So here we have a lovely satellite image over the Pacific Ocean. You can see Tucson here and, and, and Phoenix where you guys are at, um, just over the horizon here in the upper right. And so we're looking over the Pacific Ocean and we instantly are struck by the vast expanses of our ocean, which cover over 70% of the Earth's surface. So here in the Pacific Ocean, our, our largest ocean basin, the ocean stretches over 12,000 miles from Asia and Australia to here in the Americas. However, the Pacific hasn't always been this large. And this NASA animation that I'm showing you here shows what we'd see if we were to actually drain the oceans leaving behind the evidence of the evolution of our, our oceans and even the reason for their existence in the first place. So it turns out that our oceans have been shaped through Earth's history as these rigid plates move over a very viscous like peanut butter layer beneath, fueled by what we call convec convection currents. And this new rock material is created where the plates move apart on the sea floor and rocks are destroyed where the plates come together. And, and collide. And we actually owe the very existence of our ocean basin to the density differences between the rocks that form those ocean basins and the continents, which are less dense or are quite literally buoyed above our ocean uh, floor. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this video again, and you'll notice the difference in depth between the shallow continental crust that, um, that drains first here in this animation and the deep oceanic plains that are over four kilometers deep and spread away from what we call mid-ocean ridges. The crust cooling and deepening as it spreads away from this ridge. And then finally, the last thing to drain is our deep oce oceanic trenches, which plummet to as much as 11 kilometers or 36,000 feet deep at the deepest points. So in fact, the, uh, the deepest oceanic trench known as the Challenger Deep is, greater, is deeper than Mount Everest is tall. So it's really therefore pretty easy to imagine that the vast majority of water on Earth is in our oceans. In fact, it's over 97% of, of Earth's water. However, as you imagine, obviously this water is very salty. Um, and so it's really unusable to human and other life. Um, and this is exacerbated the, by the fact that the rest of the fresh water, um, much of it is locked up in, in land ice. So it's un un unavailable to us in, as humans as drinking water. So only about 1% of the remaining water is in the form of liquid fresh water. And obviously this is really important to us for our drinking water sources. But interestingly, ultimately, all of this water can too be traced back to the oceans, a, a vast majority of it at least. About 85% of the water that we drink, this fresh water, is originally sourced from evaporation off the ocean surface. The remainder of it is evaporated off of bodies of water like lakes and rivers, or off of the leaves of plants themselves in a process that we call transpiration. In addition to being the ultimate source of our fresh water, our oceans are really critical, what we call a heat engine of Earth's weather and climate, really redistributing heat from where there's an abundance in the tropics, where I work, to where there's a deficit at the poles. About a third of this energy is transported by these ocean currents and turbulent eddies that you see in this animation. And these eddies are large and small vortices that are very similar to hurricanes in the atmosphere that trap heat, spin off, carrying energy, nutrients, and even life with them. The Gulf Stream shown here in the North Atlantic is a very powerful example, and it transports uh, heat to the high latitudes where climate in Europe um, is, is highly impacted and would be much cooler today without this current. Here in the tip of North uh, South Africa, we can also see more of these turbulent eddies spinning off and carrying energy into the Indian Ocean. 
This energy transfer uh, towards the poles is equivalent to about 500,000 tons of TNT per second, or more than 30 Hiroshima bombs every second of every day. Put another way, the ocean transports over 500 times more energy than the entire US population consumes in any given year. Another two thirds of this energy is transported by our atmosphere, by the direct transfer of heat, or by the energy released when gaseous water, like shown here, uh, condenses and falls out as rain. Both in the tropical rain belt, this band of rainfall you can see along the tropics that I'll talk about a lot later, and these high latitude storms that spin off and dump rain, for example, here in the Southwest. Again, the vast majority of this water in the latent energy that it holds originates from our oceans, especially our tropical oceans. So finally, our oceans are important because they also play a critical role in shaping Earth's climate to, uh, or, sorry, Earth's response to past, present, and future climate changes. So for example, um, shown here are global air temperatures on the y-axis. Um, from 1880 to 2020 on the right. And what it's showing is that Earth's climate, its, its temperature is warming and direct response to carbon dioxide. And we know this because we also have carbon dioxide measurements that have been collected since 1958 in a place called Mauna Loa, Hawaii. And we can see that these rising air temperatures track carbon dioxide since the Industrial Revolution with warming at rates that were predicted from even the first uh, models of, of the Earth's response to greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. This acceleration of warming in recent years is primarily tied to the, the burning of fossil fuels, which accounts for 69% of this carbon dioxide emission per year, which is about 32 gigatons, which is 1 billion metric tons or 2 trillion pounds of carbon dioxide. The other significant portion is from us literally changing the landscape through agriculture, deforestation, and other changes to landscape, which account for about 24% or 12 gigatons of carbon dioxide every given year. So we know the direct link between carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and, and Earth's temperature from actually ancient bubbles trapped in the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica, which provide information quite literally of the composition of our atmosphere at the time that that bubble formed. So you can really see that in this image of a scientist holding up a, a chunk of ice from one of these ice cores, as well as the core itself, where you can see these little bubbles of atmospheric gas trapped inside. So scientists can quite literally tap into these bubbles to sample Earth's ancient, Earth's ancient atmosphere and also study fingerprints of Earth's past temperature from its, the ice itself. The results are shown here in this upper figure. So in orange here is the carbon dioxide levels over the past 800,000 years. So 800,000 years ago on the left and to present on the right. And if I now superimpose uh, Earth's temperature over the same time, we can see that Earth's temperature and CO2 has risen and fallen in tandem over the last 800,000 years, with cold temperatures and low carbon dioxide during what we call Earth's glacial periods, and warm temperatures and high carbon dioxide during periods like today, which we know uh, are between glacials or what we call interglacials. Um, critically, if we plot the uh, recent a change in carbon dioxide on top of this graph, you can clearly see that what we're currently experiencing is completely unprecedented and the nature and, and rate of this rise over the past few decades relative to anything we've seen in the past 800,000 years and likely throughout much of Earth's history. So much of these changes that we see of the last 8,000 years are, on, on the, are happening on the order of 100 or thousands of years while well, we're changing the atmosphere in a matter of a few decades. So hopefully I've convinced you that we know scientifically, absolutely, that CO2 is rising. We have direct 
continuous, reliable measurements going back to 1958 and longer from these ice core records. Um, but we find that actually warming does not directly uh, tra tra uh, track this year-to-year -year change in carbon dioxide. So if we look, we actually see a sort of stair-step warming pattern where we have decades of sort of slower warming followed by decades of really rapid warming or even um, you know, slight cooling um, in the decades following. So given that this well-established link between carbon dioxide and temperature from Earth's history, uh, the stair-step warming pattern is, is quite curious. Uh, so the question became for us scientists is where is this so-called so missing heat going within the climate system? So uh, myself and other scientists during the early 2000s in one of these uh, intervals when warming uh, seemed to slow down, uh, we really got to work to try to figure out where this quote unquote missing heat was in the climate system. And given the importance of the oceans for this talk, it's probably no surprise to you that the, the answer is, is two in our oceans. Uh, so what we basically found is that the slowdown is, um, in atmospheric warming could be attributed to the fact that our oceans are actually taking up a vast amount of heat. In fact, as shown in this diagram here, about 90% of the excess heat in recent decades, in fact, 90, over 93%, is being taken up by our oceans, while only about 2% is actually staying in our atmosphere, which is what we feel as humans um, experiencing global warming. So therefore, we actually find that during decades where the warming on, on the land surface slowed, uh, oceanic warming accelerated in, a, in, a, in a, a pattern that mirrored what was happening in the atmosphere. So our oceans were temporarily mitigating the worst effects of atmospheric warming, which is again what we feel, but actually storing heat for rapid release in the following decades, seeing this then subsequent acceleration pattern. Um, so this is really important because it really dictates um, the rates of climate change in, in the future. And finally, um, the other uh, importance of our oceans is that they also take up a, a good amount of the carbon dioxide that we're releasing. In fact, about a quarter, 25% of the carbon dioxide we've released through burning of fossil fuels is being taken up by our oceans. Uh, both through like direct ocean mixing and air sea exchange, which I'll show here in a second, but also by these really small microscopic plants that live in our surface waters. And like our rainforest shown here in the upper right, which we call this the so-called lungs of the earth, these small microscopic plants harness light energy and carbon dioxide to form the base of the marine food web. So these oceans then are really important for sequestering carbon dioxide um, and really locking it up, offsetting some of the detrimental effects of human-induced climate change. So again, to conclude this, this section, the, the oceans are really, they are really critical because they're, they're trapping heat and carbon dioxide and without our oceans, the rate of, of climate change would be much, much worse. Unfortunately, um, this benefit also comes with a, a big hidden cost. Um, and, and this is through a process we call ocean acidification. So I'm going to walk through this uh, with you guys now. So as we increase carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, which is what's showing by these, these uh, red and white molecules up here on top, uh, more and more of this carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and more and more of it is actually taken up by the surface ocean through those processes I just described. Unfortunately, when carbon dioxide mix with, mixes with water, um, much like the way soda becomes acidic when we carbonate it, uh, the, the ocean becomes um, more acidic. It becomes a weak acid. So again, carbon dioxide mixes with water and it becomes this weak acid we call carbonic acid. And like uh, household vinegar that you're familiar with, another weak acid, um, what that means is that it readily partially disassociates into its two um, constituent components, which are in this case, uh, what we call bicarbonate atoms and more importantly, hydrogen ions. And as we know, hydrogen ions are what drive pH. So we get a decrease in pH and in a process we term ocean acidification. So oceans are becoming more acidic. 
The other hidden cost of ocean acidification is that these free hydrogen ions also interact with another byproduct of carbonic acid, which is known as carbonate ions, um, that form uh, less than 10% of the, the carbon in our oceans. And this is really important because then it takes away more and more of these carbonate ions in the ocean. And this is a key ion that along with calcium forms the building block of many marine organism shells, including corals, which I study, which are the, these really framework reef builders that I'll show in here in a little bit, we really rely on as a society as well as some of these species of microscopic plants that I was alluding to earlier, they really trap and, and um, absorb some of the CO2 in our oceans. And even these sort of plant, beautiful planktonic snails known as pteropods. So this ocean acidification, as we drive these changes, is be becoming more and more difficult for these organisms to grow their shell and really impacting the entire marine food web. So again, just to summarize, we're increasing all these um, things except for um, carbon, carbonate ions, which are decreasing and making this harder for these um, organisms to grow. Okay. So now to, to summarize, given the importance of our, our Earth's oceans in terms of our heat, our water, and our carbon, um, the next part of this talk, I really want to explore with you how the oceans have changed throughout Earth's history and how they've played a role in these processes in the past. So with over 4.5 billion years of Earth's history to cover, um, that would require more than just one brown bag on its own. So uh, instead today, uh, for the remainder of the talk, I will show some examples from my own work on relatively recent changes in the tropical Pacific Ocean. Now again, not only is the Pacific Ocean vast as we already showed here in the satellite image, but it's also a really great place to start uh, because it, extremes in the tropical Pacific really have a global impact. So again, this is another plot, a slightly different version of the plot I showed earlier of global uh, surface air temperatures on the y-axis going this time from 1900 to 2020 on the right. And what we see is these record-breaking warm years, so these extreme warm years globally shown in these red dots are becoming more and more frequent as climate warms, as we would expect. But what's really interesting is that these arrows show years that the uh, tropical Pacific Ocean where I work uh, was also extremely warm. And it turns out that nearly most, all of the most extreme warm years occurred when the Pacific was also warm. So this is quite curious. And it turns out that we now know that much of these um, extreme temperatures worldwide can be in fact tied to extreme temperatures in the Pacific. So as an example of this, um, I'm gonna show the 2015-2016 events which uh, will come up uh, throughout the remainder of the talk a few times. So to orient you, what I'm showing on the left here is uh, record breaking temperatures. So the, the redder the color on this map, um, it indicates that there were record breaking warmth um, and, uh, departures in that year at that location. So in other words, it was extremely warm. Um, you will see there's a few places that were uh, a little bit cool, but almost the entire world in 2015, 2016 was exceptionally warm. During this year on the right hand side, I'm showing the same now departures in temperature. So anything that's red is warmer than normal and anything again in blue is cooler than normal. And we see a very similar pattern um, where we see this broad warming across the central and eastern portion of the Pacific during this year. So in other words, we found that warm years in the Pacific tend to also be warm years all over the world. So why is that? So these extreme conditions in the Pacific are caused by year-to-year -year changes in the strength of winds across the Pacific Basin. In normal years, the Pacific looks something like this where we have strong winds blowing from east off the coast of South America 
towards the Western Pacific. Now you can imagine like a big industrial fan blowing across a bathtub that is the tropical Pacific Ocean. These winds quite literally pile up waters, these warm waters in the Western portion of the Pacific and push waters away from the coast of South America. As a result, cool water from down below replaces the surface water, bringing cold water from depth and leading to these really cool surface uh, temperatures that we see here in yellow compared to the much, much warmer temperatures in the West. But every two to seven years, these winds weaken and you can imagine if we turn off that industrial fan, those waters sort of slosh back over across the Pacific leading to these really warm temperature extremes that we see across the central and eastern part of the Pacific, with extremely cool in the um, west and extremely warm in the east. These events um, became known as El Nino, which uh, translates quite literally uh, as the Christ child in Spanish when translated directly. Uh, due to its timing around Christmas time and its early uh, recognized impacts on fisheries off the coast of South America. But these events not only impact, like I said, climate conditions over the Pacific, they really impact us in the Southwest as well as all over the world. So for example, here in the Southwest, these events play a really big role in our winter rains, which as we know here in the desert are really important for restoring our water resources. So this is a view over the Northern Pacific and Western North America. You can see the Southwest here, us here in the, in, in the image. And what's, showing, it, what's being shown is these high intensity winter storm events that we call atmospheric rivers. And these events are more common during El Nino events when the warm waters in the Pacific evaporate um, uh, and carry water in the atmosphere towards Western North America where it, it precipitates over the, the, the Rocky Mountain uh, region. So what this animation shows is quite literally the total amount of, of water vapor in the atmosphere from surface to space. And you can see almost a wall of water being transported towards the Southwest and dumping rain across the Sierras and the Rocky Mountains. Similarly, in the tropics where I work, um, these events impact the band of, of precipitation that we call the global rain belt that tracks north and south progression of incoming solar uh, sunlight and warm temperatures from season to season and from year to year. And that's what you can see in the screen in this animation on the bottom. So this energy fuels rising air and heavy rainfall across the tropics in green. So as I play this animation of rainfall over the Pacific, you can see this migration and you can also see that the 2015-2016 event that I was talking about earlier really pulls that rain belt south and east leaving places where I work, particularly the Marshall Islands here in the north, uh, very dry and uh, severe drought conditions, really exacerbating uh, their already depleted water supply. And this is really critical because these uh, island nations, these low-lying atolls where I work, are really narrow strips of land that lie just at or just above sea level. And their really shallow freshwater resources are extremely vulnerable to waves and storm events and rising sea levels. So therefore the drought and these wind events that can cause these heavy wave action that occur during El Nino events can really threaten their already um, really vulnerable freshwater supp supplies. And as a result, actually the Marshall Islands and a lot of other low lying nations are actually projected to become uninhabitable by 2040, 2040, just around the corner, due to not just sea level rise alone, but the inundation of these really shallow water resources when they become contaminated with salt. And finally, during my own career, I first got interested in El Nino events due to their impact on coral reef ecosystems. So back in the day as an ecologist, 
um, and become interested in the role that these events play in uh, what we call coral bleaching events. So during these El Ninos, the, the waters warm up and corals become stressed by the extreme temperatures that occur during the event. And they can uh, go from being healthy to bleaching um, to dying and becoming covered by a uh, turf algae, this like filamentous algae um, on the right um, within one year. So from December 2014 to August 2015, this particular reef had completely died. And unfortunately, these events are becoming more common and more severe and really threatening coral reefs all over the world. So for example, between 2014 and 2017, it's estimated that about 75% of the world's tropical reefs experienced bleaching level heat stress, and that 30% of these reefs uh, experienced uh, mortality or, or coral deaths during these events. So what is coral bleaching? So during coral bleaching, corals actually ex expel a symbiotic algae that you can see here in green that live within their tissue and give them much of the energy they need to grow and survive. Um, and, and when this happens, it leaves behind the white, like I said, building blocks of the skeleton, this calcium and carbonate skeleton, which forms this coral reef, this critical barrier reef formation that you see here in the satellite image or this aerial image. And when they, they die, they can become overgrown with algae and unable to recover. This can really undermine this reef structure um, that's really critical for the structure and function of the coral reef ecosystem. So this is really critical because I'm sure we all love the beauty of coral reefs. Um, but coral reefs also provide a number of services that are worth an estimated three and a half billion dollars every year in the US alone. So for example, coral reefs provide an important food source for millions of people. They provide coastline protection from storm surge and erosion. And they provide habitat spawning and nursery ground for a number of economically important fisheries. They provide jobs and economy through um, recreation, re recreation and tourism. Like this is a, a picture of me diving um, as a tourist somewhere. I can't remember where. Um, and they're also um, a hot spot of marine biodiversity. But fortunately, I like to stay hopeful and optimistic. And my work has actually also shown that these El Nino events and the history of Earth's climate changes have also shaped the patterns of susceptibility and resilience. So what I'm showing here is the temperature at which corals bleach, or what we call the bleaching threshold across the tropical Pacific. In areas that are frequently impacted by these temperature extremes, that same area of the central and eastern Pacific I showed earlier, it takes about four times as much temperature, or four degrees of warming, before corals bleach versus a half a degree or one degree of warming everywhere else. So in other words, corals in these sites that are impacted by El Nino are less susceptible to coral bleaching than corals elsewhere because of this uh, extra resistance from the history of heat stress. So this discovery actually altered the course of my own career. So this young girl, myself here on the left, as an as aspiring marine ecologist, uh, would have never imagined that one day I would actually be taking cores of corals, like I'm doing here on the right-hand side, to study the history of ocean change. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna focus on our work and how we can assess ocean change of the past here at the University of Arizona using one of the ocean's own historians, which are the reef building corals themselves, who record fingerprints of ocean changes in their skeleton as they grow. So here's a time-lapse video of us coring one of these corals. And these corals can grow as much as a few hundred years old. And as they grow, they record the temperature, the salinity, and even the windiness of the environment around them as they grow. 
So again, in this time-lapse video taken by um, one of my graduate students here, Emma Reed, um, who you'll see coming in out of the picture in the blue, light blue shirt. Um, we're Coria Colony, the GRU in this lagoon of, of Majuro Atoll, which is in the Marsh Islands, and grew a few hundred years ago, but has since died and been thrown upside down on its head uh, by a, a, a large wave or storm event. And what's really cool is that just like the rings of a tree, you can see the growth bands etched in the side of this coral, marking the passage of time. So for those of you like me who are worried about the impacts this might have on the coral, I can thankfully say that no corals are lost in the collection of these valuable samples. So although we take a small portion of the colony, about yay big, um, the rest of it is unharmed. And we plug this hole with concrete plugs like you can see here. And this prevents other organisms from coming in and sort of undermining the coral colony from within. And corals actually have a remarkable ability to heal their own wounds by translating energy sideways within this coral colony, which is a bunch of little coral organisms living together in a colony. So in fact, my, my teenage self and, and inner uh, coral reef ecologist was really relieved when I returned to my first coring site. And despite the GPS and the maps and everything, we could not locate it, the colonies that we had cored a few years before because the corals had completely overgrown these concrete plugs. So again, um, they are, are quite resistant or resilient to these, um, these samples. So then what we do is we basically take cores like that um, through living, like the ones shown here on the bottom, coral colonies, or dead coral colonies, what we call fossil, sorry, fossil corals, like the one on top, which grew about 150 years ago. And this one was thrown up on the beach by a large wave event. Um, and we can take uh, a core down these, these cores in and, and, and the middle here, and when we split open the cores, we can see these alternating growth bands like rings of a tree, which are seasonal variations in the density of the skeleton that allow us to develop a very precise chronology of ocean variations shown here in red going back in time. So in my laboratory, we very painstakingly sample these corals millimeter by millimeter. So again, this is uh, Emma Reed, my graduate student, um, taking samples out of one of these cores. And we can use the geochemical fingerprints of the skeleton uh, to, to study past ocean change. To do this, we use this instrument on the bottom right, which we call a mass spectrometer, which uses this large magnet shown here in the center uh, to actually bend the constituents of each sample based on the weight of the atom so that we can analyze the relative proportions of each of these constituents within the skeleton. So we, in turn, we can use these coral records to understand how the tropical Pacific Ocean has changed through past extremes. And we can use this to re reconstruct things like past typhoons, El Nino's, uh, the location and the intensity of the Pacific rain belt, uh, the winds themselves, uh, sea level rise, and finally even the ability of corals to actually buffer against changing ocean conditions and grow the reef structure um, that form the coral reef. So we're really fortunate that the tropical Pacific Ocean also serves as a really natural laboratory with contrasting conditions from the really cool uh, Eastern Pacific in the Galapagos Islands where I work, all the way to the relatively stable, more warm conditions in the Marsh Islands and the Republic of Kiribati in the Central and Western Pacific Oceans. So for example, at our newest site in the Marsh Islands here in the Northwest Pacific, um, we're fortunate that there are many of these large coral boulders thrown on beaches like the ones shown here. And each of these provide basically a snapshot of the past climate over the 100 or 200 years over which that particular coral grew in its lifetime. And so we can piece together enough of these snapshots, we can start to capture the year to year changes in climate variability over thousands of years. 
And I really like these images because they also provide a, a, a bit of a flavor for you guys of the type of field work it takes to collect these samples and the variety of conditions these corals are found in and how difficult it is to therefore collect cores out of them. So you can, you can see that I'm, I'm, I'm hefting to core at all sorts of highly unnatural angles, including, you know, sort of sitting and straddling some of the corals in ways um, to, to get a core. Um, so a, a few of the corals, even like the one on the bottom left, uh, has a tree growing through it, um, really indicating, you know, how long it's really been growing um, uh, or, or how long it's been deposited on, on the beach. Um, and, and we're also, I want to emphasize, uh, doing this work as guests in a new culture and really respectful of the local traditions and dress. So you can see in these, in many of these images, I'm wearing uh, traditional uh, Maori dresses. Um, and we're also looking, working really closely with our collaborators in the Marshall Islands Marine Resource Authority, really aiming with this work to have on the ground impacts of management of marine and freshwater resources in these low-lying nations. So now I want to uh, give you a couple examples of how this work um, looks when it all comes together. So uh, for example, in the Marshall Islands here, these couple examples of colonies on the left, we can use these living and fossil coral colonies to assess, to assess how the frequency and intensity of El Nino events has changed in the past, for example, over the past thousand years. So again, each of these corals provides a information over of how variable the ocean was during its own lifetime, short windows of, of up to a few hundred years that we can piece together to study um, past extremes. So that's what I then I'm gonna show here in the middle panel is we, for each of these corals, we can look at how variable year to year conditions were in that particular coral, and we can compare it to how variable the conditions are today. So on the y-axis is the change in this year-to-year -year variability, so the, the, the magnitude of these wiggles um, going back over the last about 1,000 years. And so if we can piece together enough of these little dots, we can start to get a sense for how variable El Nino was in the past and whether or not it's different than it was today. The bigger the dot on this plot, the more, the longer the coral record and the more confident we can be in these estimates. So this is really just the beginning of this work. We're trying to apply this suite of corals in the Marsh Islands to really understand how El Ninos respond to changes in sunlight and volcanic activity over the last thousand years. So again, we're still in the early stages. The, the colored portions of this timeline here indicate how much we've already sampled. And we still have hundreds of years to piece together to try to get a, a picture of what happened over this time frame. But what I can show you today is how this compares to previous work that we've done further east in the Central Pacific in uh, the island nation of the Republic of Kiribati, shown in gray. And we can start to paint a picture of how El Nino strengths and frequency changed over this time. So that's what I'm going to show here in a, a work we published um, last year. And I'm going to show you results from three islands further east of the Marshalls in the Central Pacific, shown in red, green, and blue. So if we compare variability in these fossil coral colonies over the last 7,000 years, we can assess how different El Nino is today over the last, versus the last 7,000 years. The y-axis here is exactly the same as in the previous, where it's a change in coral variability. So anything positive here is more variability than in the than in the present day, and anything negative is less variability than in the present day. Um, again, the larger the dot here, the longer the coral, the bigger the colony, and the more certain we can be of this estimate. Using this approach, what we find is that the about between about three and five thousand years ago, El Nino was less frequent and intense than it is today. We also find, as indicated by the width of this gray bar, that this modern coral, shown here on right for comparison, are more variable than anything that we've observed over the last seven thousand years. 
And these changes are caused by slow changes in sunlight caused by variation in variations in Earth's orbit around the sun. So the question really becomes then, are we seeing unprecedented changes in El Nino relative to the last 7,000 years as a result of climate change? And we can do this test using this data. So what we can do is actually compare the changes that we see in the coral records to what we would just expect from natural climate variability alone. And that's what's shown in the red bars in this figure. And this green line then shows what we actually observe in these coral records, the change in modern variability relative to the last 7,000 years in green. And what we find is that there's an over 99% probability that the last few decades are unprecedented in the last 7,000 years. In other words, it's very likely that the changes we're observing in the coral records, this increase in extremes, is in fact caused by human-induced climate change. And finally, the last example from my work, we can also piece together these records from a number of sites, all the way sites in the Republic of Kiribati, plus my sites in the, the Marshall Islands, to assess how the rain belt has changed over the, the last few hundred years. So this is work being led by my graduate student, Emma Reed. And what we find is that the rain belt is moving more north and south, north and south, and response to changes in the north of the Pacific, such that during El Nino events, like I said earlier, um, when the Pacific is warm, we see extreme drought in the northern parts where the ITCC normally sits, like over the Marshall Islands. So again, this is really important because this leaves the Marshall Islands and other low-lying island nations extremely vulnerable uh, to uh, dwindling freshwater supply. So like a baseball player on steroids, climate change is really stacking the deck, making these extremes more likely to occur. And combined with pot potentially unprecedented variability in the Pacific, again, work in progress on that, but the, the data points towards these ex increased extreme extremes in the Pacific. These changes together are likely to drive more extreme droughts and more extreme floods all over the world. So too much and too little water. But I'm here today and I don't, wouldn't be doing everything that I'm doing today if I wasn't optimistic and hopeful for our future. So despite the fact that from our work and the work of climate scientists all over the world, we know that our oceans are changing at unprecedented rates. But we can also leverage that knowledge um, of how the oceans are changing and how ocean ecosystems have responded in the past to develop, to develop solutions for a more resilient future. So then I wanna end by our work in the Biosphere 2 where we're applying what we've learned across the tropical Pacific into the Biosphere 2 to really develop solutions for coral reef ecosystems in the Biosphere 2 mesocosm, which is a 700,000 gallon mesocosm or ocean tank dedicated to innovative research and education on coral reefs. So what we're doing is we're applying these lessons from history and decades of reef research to develop scalable solutions for building coral reef re, uh, resilient coral reef ecosystems. And those are coral reef ecosystems that can recover from disturbance and maintain the critical structure and function that we really need for those, those goods and services that I talked about earlier for really generations to come. For, so our kids, their kids, and their kids' kids, and so on. So these solutions can be applied to corals grown in nurseries like the ones shown here in the middle and transplanted onto the reef in a process known as coral restoration. Our collaborators at Moat Marine Laboratory are global leaders in this process of reef restoration and have had over 95% survival rate in the first few years. So for example, we can intentionally heat stress corals um, shown here in the middle uh, like fragments of corals from those at Marine Laboratory that I show here before transplanting them onto the reef. So we increase their resistance to future extremes by turning up the temperature, it's stressing them out, and then they have increased resilience when they uh, experience those events in the future. So 
So one of the questions we hope to answer with this work is how long does this resistance last? And how will these heat stress corals respond to future ocean conditions? Similarly, a really exciting project that we're working on is that we can also treat corals with probiotics, beneficial microorganisms that live within the coral organisms and increase their overall health. Very similar to the, the probiotics you might take for um, keeping a, a, a healthy flora in your, your digestive system. So working with a collaborator in, in Brazil, uh, Dr. Hakal Piag Soto, we have developed these probiotic solutions and are gonna test them right here at the Biosphere 2. These interventions will become critical as bleaching events, like I said, become more extreme and more frequent and rising carbon dioxide levels make it increasingly difficult for corals to grow. So in fact, it was here at the Biosphere 2 in Tucson where scientists in the, in the late 90s first showed that corals actually grow about 40% slower under conditions that are now expected by about 2050. As the oceans become more acidic and the abundance of those key building blocks of their skeleton become increasingly scarce. Again, undermining the structure of the coral reef system. But again, to end on a bit of hope, we do have, uh, corals do have the ability to buffer against changing ocean conditions, actively modifying the, the chemistry of the environment from which they actually grow to, to optimize their conditions for growth. So this is a, a simple schematic that I made of the coral organism, which is really closely related to anemones. You can see the same polyp structure with their tentacles for feeding, opening to a singular mouth and anus and a broad digestive cavity. So they're actively pumping ions, their building blocks of the skeleton into this solution so that they can grow quickly and form that coral reef. But my work does show that corals do have a limited ability to adapt this buffering to changing ocean conditions. So interestingly, using this approach, a very different approach than at the Biosphere 2, I similarly find that about a 40% change or reduction in growth occurs under climate change. But again, you can see that there is large spatial variability in this pattern and that the Central and Eastern Pacific corals tend to do much better than everywhere else. So to end then, where we go from here is up to us. We do have to change our behavior and reduce greenhouse gases to limit warming and avert the most disastrous effects of climate change. Well, we here at University of Arizona and uh, others in Arizona and around the world work to develop these solutions for societal and ecosystem resilience. So to put it in perspective, to reach net zero emissions, and limit warming to a few degrees Celsius, uh, which is really expected um, to be necessary to, to, to avert the most disastrous impacts of climate change. We would actually need to limit our emissions by about two to 3% per year over the next 50 years. To put this in context, this is about half the rate of emissions decline that are projected last year during the, the, the peak of the global pandemic. But this is possible, the solutions exist and are continu continuously being developed. So I'm optimistic that we too can get there together. But these changes are gonna require you guys, us and all hands on deck. So here at the University of Arizona, we're also working with our partners in the Marshall Islands and the Tucson Unified School District to develop cross-cultural education programs to really inspire change and train the next generation of scientists. So this is an example of some virtual reality experiences that we've developed at the Biosphere 2 to allow viewers to immerse in the, the beautiful reefs of the Biosphere 2 and the Marshall Islands. And it really allowed us to share these unique ecosystems, despite the fact that we're here in the Sonora Desert and seemingly very far removed from these, these ocean and reef ecosystems. We also have a number of opportunities for research. So I'd really encourage you to reach out to myself and other uh, faculty at University of Arizona, if you're interested in getting involved, we always love to have um, new partnerships and new collaborations uh, with you all. So to end, I want to leave you with one more quote from yet another inspiring female scientist. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. 
So again, we're all intricately linked to the ocean and in turn, our, our actions impact the ocean. So moving forward, it's up to each of us to decide what kind of difference we wanna make. And with that, um, I have my contact information up here and I um, look forward to hearing your guys' questions. Thank you, Diane, for an illuminating talk. We have less than five minutes and we have a very engaged audience. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> 12 questions for you, but that's okay because they can reach out to you if okay, their great. has not been answered. Uh, so I'm just gonna have to cherry pick one. Um, how, uh, this one. What could have changed to make the oceans take more heat? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, it really comes down to the wind. So uh, when winds are, are blowing strongly over the ocean, um, it, it mixes heat down into the, the ocean. And when winds are weaker, the opposite happens, that heat is, is released into the atmosphere. So it actually comes down to the winds. That's a great question. Okay, let's try to answer one more. How long till the difference in temperatures is significant enough to deeply affect us? Well, it really depends on the sort of system, but I would argue that the answer is now or yesterday. I mean, it's, it's already deeply affecting us. Um, there are, you know, like I said, the, you know, attributing any individual events to climate change is, is difficult. Uh, but these sort of extremes are becoming more um, more common. We're basically, it's like a baseball player on steroids again. We're, we're stacking the deck and making these extremes more likely. Um, and so, you know, we've had a lot of devastating examples of extreme events. Um, and on coral reefs, as an example, I mean, these events, these bleaching events are becoming uh, yearly in many places. And so the answer is really now. Yes. So as I said, please reach out to Dr. Thompson. Also follow her on Twitter where you can ask the question and start the conversation and make more people aware. I just want to thank you for joining us today for you know telling us these stories of these organisms that really need our help and we need them too. So thank you very much also to Mike Curtis and Christina Contreras for monitoring the chat and for making this possible and to CGC marketing team and to all of you joining us today, if you're a student, don't forget to click on the link to register your attendance. And please join us next month with Andy Cohen. He's going to talk about how past climate may have shaped our evolutionary history. So again, a climate change that maybe made us. So thank you again, everyone, and see you again on April. Thank you.